Even in my dreams, women have an easier life than me. Disney's Star Wars is a joke. That statement seems obvious, I know, but when you watch The Acolyte, you are left with a feeling of a deliberate joke being made on the fans, on George Lucas himself, on anyone interested in story structure, a decent moral code, or even someone who just puts a TV program on to see what all the fuss was about. The Acolyte Episode 9, entitled The Acolyte, how creative of you, that's like saying Star Wars Episode 6, Star Wars. A clear demonstration of the retardation that is to come. But anyway, let's get right into it because there is quite a lot to mention in our final episode of the Nepalite. We start off back with the member barriers of Darth Vader's breathing as Osha is still in Darth Soy's brittle helmet. Darth Soy then approaches her and what I thought was the force equivalent of giving her space Huntingtons, like a really bad family guy sketch. Helen? <laughs> was actually Osha being super duper powerful when accessing the Force, and Darth Soy helps her out. She says she can see the future, cause remember, this girl is totally anachronized, and she says May is going to do bad stuff, so she needs to go and stop the bad stuff. Isn't that nice? Dude, that's fucking great! Darth Soy, being a good little soy, says, Okay, Queen, or something to that effect, and lets her use his ship. He didn't put up much of a fight like a good and decent beta should. Sit there like a dog, waiting for treats and to be told he's a good little boy. Meanwhile, Mei is getting more monologues from Master Zanzu, but manages to pick her lock and escape while running. No, sorry, running? No, no, no. Looks more like wobbling away, as if she was 250 pounds heavier. <laughs> but anyway, she reaches a ship that has no faster than light function. Okay. But here's the best part of this scene. Sun Tzu pursues her and they both go through the rings of a nearby planet. Now, judging by the sounds of the impact of the various portions that make the rings here, it's very similar to Saturn's rings, which are made up of large chunks of ice and other materials. Those rings are not standing still. They are hurtling at a speed of approximately 35,000 miles per hour. Just to give that some context, in 2004, a joint venture between NASA and the European Space Agency sent a spacecraft to Saturn and were able to do it because of a narrow corridor in the rings. They were concerned with that narrow corridor because, and I quote, about the millions of dust particles. Dust particles. These are chunks of ice and matter. The ship would have been torn apart. Whatever, whatever. This is the sort of retardation we're talking about here. Suspension of disbelief is one thing, I know, but you can't defy reality in this way without the viewer eventually becoming pessimistic. Anyway, Master Sansu fails to reacquire her because of the furry freak that you just want to kick off a bridge ripped out the wires to the ship's speed capacities. Why does he do this? Don't know. It doesn't matter. It's never made clear outside the assumption he doesn't want May hurt for some reason. I don't know. We move on to a scene at Coruscant, and we know this because they f label it again. Wanker. And, uh, yeah. This creepy, horrible, weird, predator-looking mother yeah. And in his soft beta male voice informs Leslie Headland's wife that a dude she doesn't like is in the chamber. See? See, see what I did there? Because she's a Leslie, ah, oh, you know. Oh, hey! It's Martian Manhunter from that god-awful Supergirl series where he calls Lois, Lewis, for some reason. Oh my god, Superman's there with Lewis. And my mom. With Lewis? Oh, no. With Lewis? Did you just what say Lewis? Lewis? Is it with Lois? With Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> with Lewis. It looks the Lewis. This is the guy who doesn't like the idea of Jedi homogamy, or power itself really being in one place, and wants to review them. And quite frankly, if Star Wars simply consisted of this show, he would be the hero of the story. We have some more soy going on with Darth Soy and his mistress. But then we have a scene that caused Star Wars Fury to have his own Huntington's attack. Fuck off! That is not Plagueis watching that shit. Ugh. Yep. 
Yes, that's right. They put Darth Plagueis in the show, despite him being about 15 at the time, apparently. But of course, this means he got the idea of trying to create life from Osha, who in turn got it from lesbian space witches. Lesbian, lesbian space, space witches, witches win, win guys. guys! Everyone, Everyone cheer! cheer. Yay. Yay! We're back on Brendock, because of course we wouldn't know we were there without the f yeah. name telling us. Sun Tzu is on the planet and is off now searching for Mei. Switches his locator beacon on so the Jedi can find him, of which then goes back to Coruscant, and funnily enough, the show thinks we're smart enough to know we are there without a label this time. I ain't got a good, good, good brain. I swear, the person that she's talking to right here is Ian McDermott. But I need to get a message to him. It's urgent. This is highly unorthodox, but I shall see what I can do. You know, Sidious, but not plain Sidious, just a random voice cameo, I guess. Okay. So yeah, Leslie Headland's wife gathers a bunch of extras with no speaking lines posing as Jedi, along with the creepy pervert, and go off to find Sun Tzu. Anyway, we go back to Brundock again, because the series can't stay in one place for five minutes, and we see all our main characters are starting to converge. Sun Tzu is hunting Mei while getting his PTSD on, Darth Soy and his mistress are here trying to get into the old lesbian witch cult lair, and Darth Soy is able to just, well, evaporate, I guess because he disappears and then reappears on the other side. How? No idea, but it's fine. Don't think. The series and its shill army will get mad if you think. May is inside already, climbing walls like a diverse Lara Croft, and then we see Osha bypass the controls to get through the door. But I have a question. Didn't the generator that powered everything blow up when she was a kid? I only ask because where in the name of Zeus's butthole did the power come from to activate the door? Guess he just crapped it out, left over from a Zack Snyder film or something. Then Darth Soy confronts Sun Tzu and they have a little girl fight. A fight I have no doubt. Every shill from all over the world will drop their jaws in astonishment and claim, this is the best Star Wars they have ever seen, since the last best Star Wars they have ever seen, and until the next best Star Wars they have ever seen. You see how that goes? There's a little Matrix moment in their slapping contest. I'm sure she had nothing to do with it, but yeah, whatever. I think I've lost track of how many times in this episode Sun Tzu relights his lightsaber in a stance that's meant to be intimidating. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mei and Osha have a little reunion where Mei is like, Oh my god, Soul like killed our mom and stuff. That's why we, you're like such a downer all the time. It's because of a man. I know she's like, you're a big doo-doo face. And they start fighting. But please, check out this music while they have their little tiff. Blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry, did you think this was your Jewel of the Fates moment? Okay, fine, let's compare. Meanwhile... I'm thinking Duel of the Fates wins. Darth Soy and Sun Tzu keep up their fight. Did the lightsaber just scream? Okay, whatever. Sun Tzu destroys Darth Soy's lightsaber but doesn't manage to kill him. Another moment for me to say... Okay. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sun Tzu has basically got Darth Soy essentially under arrest, but then Mei has to step in because she's a strong, independent woman and doesn't like Sun Tzu for stabbing her mummy. Mei obviously forgets that her mummy, her dear precious lesbian mummy, was trying to change her into the Disney equivalent of Lost Smoke Monster. Darth Soy then tries to convince her to kill Sun Tzu, but she's like, nah, I want him to feel bad, so I want the Jedi Council to like hear him confess and stuff. Okay, by the rules of the series, she wants the Jedi to oversee Sol's arraignment, as it were, even though this is meant to be the organization that the series is implicating in covering up murders and lies and all sorts of other fun stuff. You, the woman who has been going around killing said Jedi because they wouldn't confess their ill-placed guilt, now are okay with handing him over. Right, for a third, fourth, or even fifth time today because I've lost count. Um, okay? Oh, but then Osha overhears Sun Tzu confess he killed Mummy and then decides to force choke him. 
Yes, that's right. Another iconic moment they are stealing. And kills him, in fact. Making both sisters murderers. And then, because she's such a wrong un, the lightsaber bleeds red in her hand. Do you realize how long it took for Vader's lightsaber to bleed red? I'm not a lore expert, but it took a lot. Anyway, Leslie Headland's wife, Creepy Predator, and the Jedi extras arrive, and of course, too late. They're essentially the equivalent to the UK police. They arrive too late at every single scene. The murdering siblings decide to run. They climb through all the passages that May did when she got out as a child, including one that looks rather familiar. Oh, and before I forget, there's an indication that Headland's wife and Darth Soy know each other, that he was a pupil. We all knew that would be the case due to the marks on his back looking like a whip had done it. Who cares? Moving on. But yes, the Jedi are in the cult temple. They find one dead master, Sun Tzu. Hedlund's wife senses basically everything that's happened here. A complete story of what happened when the girls were younger. That's, uh, <laughs> that's nice and convenient. Anyway, we have the Jedi pursuing the murder twins, as I'm going to call them now. Make it back to that f tree again from episode three. And who pops up but Darth Soy, who suggests Osha, his mistress that he would probably suck toes with given half a chance, goes off with him to train and May gets her brain wiped. She did what? And May's like, oh yeah, that sounds awesome. Suck my memories out, big boy. Daddy, chill. He being the little horny soy that he is, wipes her mind while they're hugging, or hopes they aren't hugging, but we won't go there. May is then taken away by the Jedi, interrogated, told about her sister even though she's meant to forget her. Another okay moment. The Jedi call the politicians and say, we had a wrong and do some bad stuff, but it's totally not all of us and was just this one bad man. She literally says, it's the work of one flawed man. While this is a terrible tragedy, it was the work of one flawed man. I bet Hedden was strumming the old beam when she saw that part of the episode. We see Osha and Darth Soy being the best mistress and beta they can be, and just when you think we're all done with this monstrosity, a glimpse of Yoda appears. This show makes me hate everything. So yes, that's it. That's the vision that Leslie Hedden set out to do, to pervert and destroy everything that George Lucas Star Wars was based on. To say that good is not always good, and that bad, well, it's about perspective, right? Right? Wrong. If a cult in the real world has two children that are the only children there, that are being worshipped, that are being hidden from the world, you know what my reaction is? Why don't you have a seat there and uh, get comfortable for that? That they're f yeah. perverts. Everything the Jedi did in the series is justified. The parts that are not, which are the parts where they cover up not once but twice this incident, are so forced, so purposeful by the writers that their agenda just shines through. That agenda being to make the Jedi bad. Problem is, their actions don't reflect that. So what we are left is a series broken in two, if I'm being generous about it. I don't know why I am. But it will be broken in two in terms of 80% justified action and 20% not justified, but just for the sake of it. This is by far the most damaging to Star Wars I have ever seen. I never thought I'd say that after the sequel trilogy. But the thing is, the sequel trilogy can be written off because it comes after the OG. This is well before and has massive ramifications for the universe itself. Everyone, and I'm going to really say this, this is my personal opinion, of course, doesn't reflect anyone. Everyone involved in this show should be ashamed of themselves. If I found out I was working on something like this, I would walk away. Yes, some may say, well, that's all fine and good, but a payslip's a payslip. No, no, no. Hollywood is dying anyway. All you would be doing is leaving before the Titanic has fully sunk. Well, that's all I've got on this. I, I don't think I could say anymore. I'm sure more in-depth analysis will be done by much more well-versed people in the law, but for me, I, I'm just going to sign off now. In fact, I'm going to sign off by saying... Hollywood wasn't kidding when one of its directors said, I'll destroy your mythos in a day. Good night and take care, everyone.